Hi everyone, my name is Riley and I'm in my final year of my Bachelor of Art History and Curating. Uh, today I'm going to give a lecture on something that I have always found very interesting personally and outside of my studies, um, but is very intertwined with practically everything I've been studying since I began being so passionate about art history in 2018, 2019. Um, and this is one of the first things I think I, I learned about even in year 11 and 12 was the biblical relevance that is still in art history, which is something that at this point we all discuss quite often. But um, today the case study I'm going to use is the story of Judith beheading Holofernes. Um, so the biblical context, Judith beheading Holofernes is a deuterocanonical story from the Septuagint um, Catholic Eastern Orthodox Christian Old Testament of the Bible. It speaks of a young Jewish woman from Bethulia, a town that becomes besieged by an Assyrian army, um, which is led by General Holofernes. The Assyrian region was, as you can see in this top map, what is now northern Iraq and southeastern Turkey, uh, and Bethulia sits just above Jerusalem, where that arrow is pointing. So uh, Judith establishes a plan, and with the help of her maidservant, she gathers wine and food and leaves the city to visit the Assyrian camp. She explains to the guards that she intends to betray her city and can help General Holofernes succeed without losing any of his own men. Um, he's instantly infatuated with her and accepts her offer, invites her to stay at the camp. On her fourth night there, she's invited for a banquet into his tent. Um, he drinks too much wine, promptly falls asleep, at which point she grabs his own sword, cuts off his head, goes in the bag in which the food and wine was brought. They leave inconspicuously, and the next day the head of Holofernes is displayed on the city walls, which scares away the rest of the Assyrian army. Judith is a hero. She's a traditional feminine biblical hero, and that is why this story, I believe, has been retold so many times over and over again by a multitude of artists, including uh, Carlo Pellicani, Giorgio Vasari, Cristofano Allori, Fede Galizia, Artemisia Gentilisi, Paul Rubens, Caravaggio, quite famously, and even in contemporary settings, such as this work by Italian street artist Salvador Benintende, or TV Boy. And there was also a film adaptation, the silent film, from 1914, starring Blanche Sweet and Henry B. Walthall, which I did watch, which was quite interesting to see this story that I've become quite familiar with portrayed cinematically, not only that, but in silent film form, um, to see what was the most core points of a story that they could expand to, what, an hour and a half. I found that quite interesting. I've put the link at the end of... Um, at the end of this lecture so you can have a look if you would like um but in these yes in these traditional depictions she's she's gentle vulnerable pure um there's this dedication to fulfilling her duty um for her people for her town for city and um especially in caravaggio's version you can see that the stress in her eyes um like she's aware that of what she's doing and, and of her innocence being lost perhaps. Um, but what I'm going to talk about the most today is the practically antithetical <laughs> Judith and the Head of Holofernes by Gustav Klimt, which I believe represents a psychosexual revolution for the character of Judith. Uh, he painted this in 1901 when the Yugen style movement was focused on the stylization of these modernist topics to the point of extreme aestheticized beauty. Um, and not only is Judith uh, here beautiful, but she's also um, fitting into Klimt's golden age um, and adorned with golden leaf, like much of his oeuvre at the time, which is decorative and visually pleasing, but um, 
also implies that he's really shifting some things here. It's not traditional. It's not completely um, focused on being an historical painting. Um, and with his influences at the time being exotic, mostly oriental, a mix of Japanese, Chinese, uh, Egyptian, Byzantine, European avant-garde styles, you can see he's experimenting and trying to reinterpret Judith's story for a modern audience in a wildly controversial, wildly modern way. There's no sword, there's no bag, there's no maidservant, there's barely a head. You could practically take his name off the title of that beautiful gilded frame in the middle because it's, it's not. It's not the same story. It is. But you wouldn't know that unless it said it, and that's why I think he has spelled it out there because it's not about that anymore. You can see his intentions to shift the narrative and to capture this self-empowering woman. And that is why it's definitely controversial because of its sexual energy and orgasmic nature for a biblical story especially. Um, and at the time, Sigmund Freud, as much as we can be critical of his work and persona now. There's, that's a different um, conversation for a different day. He was exploring psychosexuality and the significance of sex and lust in our everyday lives and in society as much as it was not discussed and very suppressed. Um, and Klimt was challenging that. So viewers were seeing Judith, the same biblical figure who had been presented purely and vulnerably in such a disturbing way when contrasted, um, especially throughout the time, that's so seductive, so sex-saturated um, and open about this. She's become a lust-filled predator. Um, an American art writer, Mary, Mary uh, Constantino, says this of Klimt's portrayal. He hasn't portrayed her as a heroine who killed in order to free her people, but as a sensuous woman whose lust has turned her into a seductress and a murderer. She is the personification of sin and sexual gratification. She's everything all the other Judiths were not. Um, she's, she's oozing this sexual energy um, as she's standing with the head in her hands, like gaining it from it. She knows exactly what she's done and she loves it. She's a femme fatale, clearly taking pleasure in her actions. Which leads me to um, discuss that, by definition, a femme fatale is an attractive and seductive woman, especially one who is likely to cause distress and disaster to a man who becomes involved with her. Judith, um, heavily popularised in 1940s, 1950s classic film noir, um, but it is also important to note that majority of Western media has Judeo-Christian and mythological roots, so there's that. But uh, technically, this, this technically biblical and historical painting is pushing itself into the origins of popular of a popular culture trope, trope that still exists today, that we're still discussing today. It's 2022 and I'm giving a lecture on it. Um, just as there have been rises and falls in biblical interest and storytelling, um, especially in art history, the femme fatale has faced similar, as a trope, has faced similar um, effects it faced its fall with the popularization of the all American good girl in cinema. But in defense of the femme fatale and in defense of Judith, she's what has revolutionized the traditional view of women and has empowered them, even if it is not with the same intentions. The femme fatale represents a reclamation of power and fierceness and. It seems that the early epitome, the emblem of this, was Klimt's Judith. 